Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Ashley. I'm with the Global Campaign for Education, and we are here and joined by Christy Vilsack, who is the Senior Advisor for International Education at USAID. And before we kind of kick into this, I'll give a little bit more details about Christy. She is a teacher, a writer, a reader, a politician, and an advocate for literacy in libraries, which makes a lot of sense for our <laughs> Google Hangout literacy as a link. Uh, she, when she's not traveling to talk about USAID's education priorities, she and her husband, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack, are enjoying the company of their sons, daughters-in-law, and four grandchildren. Right. So we are so glad to have her here <laughs> with us today. She is in our offices. We're so glad she's able to join us. She's going to share a little bit about literacy and how important it is, how it can connect all of us, and what we can do to help make sure that everyone around the world has access to books. Well, thanks so much for inviting me and for that nice introduction, and thanks to all of you who are joining us today. I think because it's September, I need to say since I've been a teacher for over 40 years that when I open the door on a September morning and I feel that Christmas in the air, I halfway expect to hear the Mount Pleasant High School marching band practicing across the street from my house uh, where I could actually see my eighth grade classroom from the window of my home because it was just a block away. So. Uh, in terms of my passion for literacy and for education, it goes back to spending hours and hours at the public library in small rural Iowa to going back there to teach for 25 years. And then my life took a dramatic tur drastic turn toward politics and advocacy, and I've really been doing that ever since. But four years ago, I came to USAID. And now I spend a lot of time talking to whomever will listen to me, uh, other folks in government, uh, people in countries around the world, people on the Hill, congressional members, senators, and representatives. And a lot of times, as much as I love talking to all those other people, my favorite thing to do is to come to college campuses and talk to college students and uh, professors, administrators, and also people who live in college. I think they're such great advocates for uh, international literacy and literacy generally. So that's the background I come from. I'm proudest, besides being a mom and a grandma, now I'm proudest of being a, a public school teacher in, in, uh, in Iowa and in New York and, and uh, part of domestic education. But I've had the privilege of do and learning more and becoming a spokesperson for that too. So I want to talk a little bit. I just want to start by talking about a teacher who I met in Malawi because for me, uh, as a teacher myself and as an advocate for education, I always like to make the point that the most important resource we have in education, whether it's domestically or internationally, are our human resources, mm -hmm. our teachers, and making sure that we take care of them and that they are uh, emotionally and physically strong and feel safe in their classrooms and they have the tools that they need, um, they will do a good job because there's one thing I know for sure and that is that teachers want to do a good job and want to teach children and want to continue to develop themselves as professionals. So I have a picture in my mind, it's actually a photograph I took in Malawi of a teacher named Anita Banda and the picture shows her in front of a class, she teaches second grade in a rural community in Malawi, and it shows her standing in front of a class of 200 children. And I, as I said, I feel thrilled going to school every day, or every day of the year and in September is on that first day of school, but I have to wonder uh, how a teacher who's got 200 children, and if you see this photograph, you would see that, that her children don't have enough desks, they don't have enough pencils, they don't have enough textbooks, in fact, they're writing their letters in the air, and you have to wonder how how do you actually solve this problem? And at USAID, we're and with our many many partners, including the folks here at GCE and many of you out there, and many many nonprofits and and private uh, private for profits and foundations, NGOs, all of our partners, we have this huge problem to solve. And we have three basic goals to our strategy, but the one that I'm going to talk about today really is the one that focuses on teaching 250 million children to read around the world. And you have to think, this is such a huge problem. When you see Anita Bonda standing with those 200 children, you think, how do you teach 200 children to read? Uh, in many cases, teachers don't have the tools that they need, but they also don't have the professional development they need. Now, Anita, we had trained her, so she knew about 
student centered classrooms and she knew about the science of teaching reading. She knew, she knows that um, children need to practice reading, they need tech, they need to use a textbook, that they need to learn to read in local languages, um, that their teachers need to be trained, that they, uh, as I said, in local languages and mother tongue, they need to read. So she understands the science of teaching reading, um, but it's hard to do it when you don't have the tools mm -hmm. that you need. So what we do at USAID, which I think is really important to understand, is when you have such a big problem, you have to break it down in, into pieces. And so that bigger issue of how we teach children to read, how we get 250 million children, some of whom don't have access to education, some have access but they don't have the tools or the teachers aren't trained or they can't get to school, whatever the barriers are that we, we need to figure out how to take away those barriers. So what we focus on is working with ministries to make sure that we know what their priorities are and that we involve them. We have a, a, an assessment, a test that we use to help ministers of education see where their children are and at what level they're reading. Uh, we, as I said, we create textbooks in local languages. Uh, we actually train parents to be school board members and PTA members. That's some of the best money we spend and it doesn't cost very much, but it's really, really important to have parents involved. So that's how we break it down into pieces. But but we have one problem. We know that we can't be successful teaching 250 million children to read around the world, even if we do all of those things. If, if every child has a textbook, uh, if every child has a teacher who's learned the science of reading, uh, if we have an assessment, if we have involved ministers, if we have involved and we have systems, if we have involved uh, parents and a a culture of reading, we still can't do it if children can't practice. Uh, and children can't practice if they don't have supplemental reading books, if they can't ha have a school library or a public library or a classroom library. And in all the schools I've been to, in all the 18 countries I've been to in the last four years, almost every school I've been to just doesn't have shelves filled with books. There aren't those resources for children to take home with them to practice. And uh, we know whether you're playing the violin or whether you're a soccer player, no matter what you are, if you don't get a chance to practice, you're not going to get better. So we now take that problem, the problem of how do we teach 250 million children to read if they don't have books, and then how do we solve that problem? So that's where we are right now. And uh, we have gathered the education community um, together, and we have created a Global Book Alliance. Mm. That And that Global Book Alliance involves all those partners I was talking about, including you. But it involves uh, private partners, NGOs, uh, for-profit partners, uh, bilateral organizations like GPE. It involves... Uh, it involves all of our the other donor countries, mm -hmm. and we're trying to trying to bring everybody together: the librarians of the world, the technology people of the world, everybody who has anything to do with literacy, everybody interested in that uh, fourth goal that we have to reach before 2030, and try to engage them and trying to figure out and use cr all of our creative energy to figure out how we get those books in the hands of children. And so, when you break that problem down. Then you have to look at, first of all, uh, we don't have any books. They haven't been written yet in many cases in the local languages. So we actually have to write these books. And these are the kinds of books that, if you think about back to when you learn to read, they're the kinds of books, uh, very simple reading books that give you the chance to practice. And we need to have somebody create them in all those languages. Uh, we need to make sure that we reduce the cost of these books so that ministries can afford to order uh, thousands and thousands of books every year. And we have to work with publishers in order to make sure that those books exist, that they, we can publish them, that the ministries can purchase them, and that they're, we have a cost-effective way of providing the books. We have to have a way of getting the books to the children, literally the supply chain. And at USAID, you know, we were originally created to, to make sure that we took humanitarian aid to people in conflict and crisis, and we were delivering bags of, of grain, which we still do. So we need to figure out how to get the books from their publishers into the hands of kids. And we need a place to put the books that we create. We actually want to create a digital library in the cloud 
so that we can put all of these books digitally so that anybody, whether you're an individual teacher or whether you're a publisher, can download the books that we're creating in any language, in, in Urdu or in Bimba, in Hausa, uh, in Spanish or French or whatever the language is, that we have these books digitally so that they can be accessed. Um, and then we also have to make sure that teachers understand how to use supplemental readers in a classroom uh, so that if they have the books, then they will have the professional development to actually make use of them in a way that will help children progress and learn. So that's where we are right now. And as we celebrate International Literacy Day this week on Thursday, we're bringing together a lot of our partners to celebrate what we've already done, 10 years of our early grade reading assessment. Uh, certainly the strategy that we've been working on the last few years, which focuses on children reading, but also we'll be making some announcements around the, the Global Book Alliance because we're trying to move it forward and we want to invite people uh, to be part of that. And we actually have, uh, we'll be putting a website up on Thursday for the Global Book Alliance, globalbookalliance.org. If people want to go online and check it out, we'll be building that out so it's not like everything is complete. In fact, you have to think about this as we're still building the foundation of this building. So it's not like everything is all done. And what we want to do, uh, which involves college students, uh, at a really elementary level, taking that how do you solve this problem all the way down to where many of you are if, if you're in college or at a university right now. So we want people to understand that even though these are huge problems, each one of us, uh, in whatever sphere of influence we have, can be a part of helping getting these books into the hands of children. And right now, um, and I don't have it right here in my hand, but I bet I can get it in a few minutes, is that we have, uh, we've created a software through our All Children Reading Grand Challenge, and we actually had a competition, and SIL uh, created a piece of software for us that with a short train will allow anybody in the world, really, to use our software, the Bloom software, to start creating books for children in local languages. And I say that this is a little piece of magic because this is our all children reading Bloom software that you can put this flash drive into any computer in the world. That's amazing. And with a short training, any of us, in fact, we've done this in Ethiopia with volunteers at a week-long training, and in that week, um, they were able to create 15 books in three different languages, which we hope the ministry will approve so that they can start using those in their classrooms. But we need to do that all over the world. And while there will be some people who will write great books that will become part of that uh, global library, what we want to do on college campuses is simply help we want to build champions, and we want to use this software as a way to let college students, faculty, and community members uh, play around with the software, try writing a book, see what it's like, uh, maybe go ahead and, and work it all the way through. But we're creating what we call uh, bookathons on campuses on Saturday mornings, on Thursday evenings. Uh, they're supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a way to introduce. Uh, students and faculty members and community members to the software and let them try to write a book. And in the process, we hope that they will understand that bigger issue that, that concerns all of us, and that is uh, what do we need to do funding-wise, what do we need to do uh, through all of our organizations at whatever level we can to make sure that we create these books and get them into the hands of children. So uh, my assistant, Amy, who's here with me, has worked really hard to create a handbook so that really anybody uh, eventually will have it on our website or you can contact us at uh, usaideducationoffice.org and ask us to, to help you get started. But we would like to encourage all of you, whether you're part of a faith-based organization or whether you're part of a... Uh, a sorority or fraternity or some sort of campus organization, if you want a project to do, I think using this software and uh, encouraging people on campus to start creating books is a good way to build awareness and to build champions for international education. Uh, we tried this for the first time at Indiana University. They were great to create, sort of to be our pilot. And we spent a Saturday morning, we had 15 different languages represented in the room. We had faculty, community, the mayor stopped by. Uh, we had a good time uh, creating books. 
and uh, but we also are going to be this Saturday we're going to be working with uh, George Washington University freshmen who are doing orientation and they're doing a community service project so we're going to be working with some of them to create books and then uh, on the 17th we'll be at uh, Gallaudet, uh, Gallaudet University uh, with the president's faith-based community servants conference so we'll be introducing the software to college leaders from all over the country so that they might take this back to their their campuses. We'll be at the University of Texas San Antonio where they've got 17 different community organizations who are sending teams to write books. And we're also going to be at the University of Iowa in Iowa City on October 6th to participate in UNESCO's Book Week there uh, and to do a, a program with the Teachers College on the University of Iowa campus and their Teacher Learning Center. We've got some other things uh, also, we'll be at MIT, I think, in November and a few places in between that we haven't quite gotten figured out yet. But we want to make this so that with Amy's handbook, that really, without our help, any of you student leaders should be able to take the handbook. It's not prescriptive at all. It's really open-ended because every college that we're doing this, wherever we're doing it, they're doing it a little bit differently. And it's meant to be just some suggestions for getting started and for continuing. And we hope that on our website, we'll eventually have a place where you can, can register your event just to say that you've done it. Um, so that we'll have a list of all these places that this is going on all over, all over the country. Because as much as we are talking about these issues internationally, as someone who's been in domestic education most of my life, Two things. First of all, Americans have huge hearts, and we pay our taxes, and that's what pays for a lot of this. But people want to get involved at some level that's much more personal than that. And that's why I really like the idea of, of using the software. And anybody can go online right now to uh, bloomlibrary.org and have access to the software. We use these in the countries that we go to because they don't have Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we use the flash drives in other countries so they can access the software because we download it. But all of you can go out there and start playing around with it. There are tutorials so that most of you digital natives should be able to figure it out in five or 10 minutes and get started. Um, but we hope uh, that this is something that will engage people at a really grassroots level. And uh, because there's so much, when you see a big problem like that, you think, well, there's just nothing I can do about it. But I really think there is. And I actually think that the software, because it's all open source, will be as valuable to domestic teachers. So if any of you out there are thinking of teaching or are teachers already or are retired teachers, uh, I think that with the diverse communities we have in this country, that this resource is going to have a lot of unexpected consequences and will be a real resource for teachers in this country as well. So I hope that people will think of creative ways to use it because as an open, as open source software, uh, there aren't restrictions on it. Uh, so people will find ways to make it better, I'm sure. But that's kind of what we're doing from the top, the big problem all the way down to what you can do about it. And I'm just happy to be here to engage all of you in conversation. And I don't know if you have any questions for me, um, but uh, I'm happy to talk about it. Sure. I think this definitely excited me on a couple levels, just having been a teacher and knowing how important it was for kids to have books to take sure. home. They would get super excited. Can I take this book from our library? Can we? But then also just as a reader, I, I was that kid who was going to the library every summer and checking out like 20 books and then <laughs> coming back the next week and returning those 20 and getting 20 more just because that was my summer activity. I absolutely right. love to read and I think it's very important that we make this accessible to everyone. And so I just like clicking into all of that and just thinking about like even for everyone who's thinking about, oh, you know, I'm talking about it's such a big problem. but I think one um, quote that I heard recently that has really guided me is Marley Diaz. She's talking about her quest and her, she's like, well, if you have a program that starts and it only helps five people, that's okay. Because right. you just keep helping those five people. And then when that's done, you help five more. And then that's done, you help five more. And I think that's so important because it's a good way to kind of take it one chunk at a time. Right. We all only have, we have our sphere of influence and whatever that is. If we start there, that's absolutely correct. Uh, wherever you are, with, whether it's your own children, 
um, or your next door neighbors, it doesn't have to be your own children. Mm -hmm. They're all our children, so we can start and just keep going. Yeah, because it's like if reading is important to you in any way, is it because you love the library or you felt like a book never looked, you know, you never found a story that resonated with you? Like this is a great opportunity write it. to write it. <laughs> and I think the other thing there is to think that it's not, we certainly want fiction stories. And in many of these countries, in our own country, there are wonderful folk tales that mm -hmm. are told. Uh, I was reading one uh, the other day, a book, Pat Mora, who's a Latina author in this country, American Latina author, is coming to uh, our International Book Day on Thursday. And she wrote this wonderful story about the old men who come out of the mountains. And it's the abuelos, the grandfathers. Uh, but they're dressed up like the old men in the mountains and they come down from the mountains once a year to make sure the children are are doing their studies <laughs> and minding their parents. And so it's a wonderful folk story that she's been able to turn into a book. And a lot mm. of us have those family stories or parts of our culture that could be put into a book. But also a lot of kids like nonfiction. Yeah. They want to know how things work. Uh, so there are a lot of no matter what your expertise is, whether you have a great imagination and you want to imagine characters, or whether you want to explain how something works. It's a great opportunity. So I just kind of wanted, I mean, this is, you talked a lot about your travels and where you've been and the mm -hmm. classrooms you've been in. So I was just kind of wondering if there was an inspiring story from one of the classrooms you visited beyond the one that you shared about the teacher teaching 200 yeah. kids, some of us that we can't even imagine <laughs> what, what happened. I think I was overwhelmed when I had 30 kids in my right. classroom. So just kind of what's like classrooms, what's going on in the classrooms? Right. Way. And I think, you know, Anita Bond in that classroom inspired me because of what it didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and because, because I saw that she was trying to become a better teacher, but she needed those tools. But I've been in so many classrooms around the world where I saw teachers, including her. They're amazing examples, and they're they're teaching. They are teaching, even though they don't have those things. And if you don't have a pencil, you can write in the air. So I, I've seen some incredible teachers, and I remember trip. The thing who I call I call her Teacher Anne, and she had been taught to have a student-centered classroom. So even though the norm in many countries is to stand up there with the pointer and have children recite, and they're not really reading, they're just memorizing and reciting, that she was moving around her classroom because she'd been taught to do it. She was using she had made her own uh, props basically. She had brought things from home. Um, and she was teaching a lesson and calling not on just the smartest child in the class who was back there in the back of the room raising his hand and wanting to be called on every time, but she was involving everybody in the classroom and to see her actually using what she'd been taught to do. And then in Honduras, I was in the classroom of a seventh grader who had been a peer teacher for five years, which means she was in first grade when she started teaching uh, her classmates, and she was actually teaching first graders um, triangles and rectangles and squares and she had created all of her own teaching tools and she said someday I want to be a teacher and I thought honey you are a teacher already <laughs> you are doing a better job than a lot of people I've seen in classrooms that have everything she was just amazing mm -hmm. and a young man in um, in the DRC who was actually in a classroom where we were we were actually evaluating whether giving a teacher a world reader uh, in an iPad the situation where they're using a script for that teacher who was a new teacher he was like 19 years old and he had some training but not a lot so he had a scripted lesson and he was using the iPad he could touch on a word and it would pronounce it for him and for the students if he didn't get it quite right because he was learning right along with them but he'd been given an award as being one of the best teachers of the year so uh, in Zambia where we were in community schools, much like those that were created on the prairie when my grandmother was teaching, uh, where they pluck the 19-year-old, the smartest kid in the class with no, no teacher education, and put them in a classroom, and they're doing their very best. And I walked into a classroom in a school like that that was completely run. The parents had hired the teacher. Maybe she got paid a bag of meal. Maybe they said they gave her a place where she could live. But she was teaching for the love of teaching. And I've got blonde hair, and I'm a white person. And I was in rural, very remote Zambia. And when I walked into her classroom, these little kids were so involved in the story she was reading to them, they paid absolutely no attention to me. <laughs> and I thought, boy, 
there is a good teacher. Again, she probably doesn't know she's a good teacher. I'm sure she can be better as she gets training, but she had uh, what it takes to be a great teacher. So I'm inspired all the time. I was inspired in Jordan. There were these, a group of four or five teachers. They'd been hired to teach Syrian refugee children. So they were like the second string and they came in after school or late in the day to teach the Syrian kids. And there was a Syrian mother there who said, she had a first grade son and she said, you know, I've lost, I've lost my parents, I've lost my husband, I've lost my home, and I can't work here in Jordan. And she said, the only thing I have left in the world is that first grade son. Mm -hmm. And he's so traumatized that he can't learn. And the teacher who was his teacher was there in the room and she said, oh, but every day, every day he's getting better and better and I thought and, and these teachers so wanted to continue being able to teach these children and to see that kind of dedication uh, you just have to feel hopeful that even though these problems seem to be insurmountable in some ways as long as you have people mm -hmm. those kinds of teachers in the classroom and each of us as I said whether it's uh, a president and cabinet and an administration committed to education or whether it's a a for-profit, a company committed to education, or whether it's company creating an innovation uh, for education, or whether it's those of us who activate the grassroots uh, to be involved, to write a letter, to go out and speak, to, as you say, take five children, um, and, or, or just stand up in your community and make sure people understand that, other people understand that it's important to invest in international education because it's going to make us all safer. And it's going to make us all more prosperous if we move people out of poverty and and give them a chance, especially girls. I definitely love how you see the connections when all your travels, the things that make us so more much more similar than different. I just I remember I traveled to Haiti a couple of years ago, and I just remember going to a school, and it was just like this school could be anywhere. It's just mm -hmm. kids are excited, they're playing, they want to learn, and it's just so great to I think really focus on the similarities as opposed to what makes us different and have that connect us, which I think is why literacy, like the, our title mm -hmm. of our Google Hangout, it's just like it connects us. Like everyone wants to learn how to read. It makes and everyone like the worlds that are opened up when you read a book and the things that you see and the things that you read. It's it's really amazing and and. I I think back uh, because I've been around longer than maybe a lot of people who are listening uh, so I can I can see back generations and in terms of girls education and what it will do for girls I think about my grandmother who I just mentioned who in the early 1900s her father let her go to college for a year which was almost unheard of mm -hmm. it was 60 miles away and she actually had a year of education before she taught but because she got that year of education she made sure her two daughters had two years of education, so they went got to go at that time to normal school. And then they taught in one-room schools, and their salaries helped pay for my dad to get a college education. And then my dad paid for my education, and I have uh, a bachelor's degree and a couple of master's degrees. So you see where that takes you. And so when we get impatient, I think we sometimes have to look at our own country and think, we were a developing country not that long ago. Public education has evolved. We still have a long way to go. We have our own issues to take care of, but um, we we can learn a lot from what we've seen happen in our own country and to have the patience that if you keep working at this, that it's going to change things. And I, I think when I was in Malawi, um, I was with a little girl that, who I talk about a lot. Her name is Martha and she's in first grade, so she's just learning to read. And I had a reading specialist with me who was helping to implement our program. And I said, so how is Martha's life going to be different when she learns to read? And he said, well, I grew up in this area. And he said, uh, she will be a farmer. Look around you. You're surrounded by corn. And I said, I know. I feel right at home. This is just like looking out my window at home. So, but he said, she will be a farmer, but she'll be a better farmer, more prosperous farmer, because she'll be able to read the extension information, and she'll be able to produce more crops. And she'll be a healthier woman, because again, she'll have access to healthcare information, and we know that a girl who knows how to read, her children will live past five years old. So she also will be a leader in her community, and, um, and she'll also probably make the choice for herself to have fewer children, so she'll have more time and energy to spend with them. So she'll be healthier herself. And we know that for every year of education that a girl has, the gross national product of that country 
uh, goes up and uh, her income goes up by about 10% for each year. So focusing, all of these things aren't, they are all interrelated. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure kids are fed well, they come to school, that they're well fed, they have nutrition, um, that they, uh, that agriculture is an important component of it, that not everybody is going to be a, a, a scientist uh, and work for an organization like NASA right away that it may take several generations and that you still want to have uh, healthy agricultural communities because that's an honorable thing to do for your whole life as well. So I, I don't see, I'd like to blur the lines. And in doing so, I think as we're looking at our sphere of influence, it's not just the province of teachers mm -hmm. and educators to pay attention to international education. I was just looking at the global monitoring report before I came over here and that can be very sobering. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's responsibility. Yeah. It's, it's in this country, it should be our own domestic education department. We're working with them. We're working with the agriculture department because they're helping to feed kids. And they can help us figure out how to do this book supply chain. They know how to deliver bags of grain. So we can look at them and say, help us figure out how to deliver the books. Um, so we need to be looking across our own country, but also uh, blurring the lines between all those uh, development goals that we're talking about too, because education is not just number four. If you look at all of those goals, education is a part of all of them. Yeah. And at the basis of that, the keystone to everything, if you learn to read, you can read to learn. And for me, that's, uh, if I only get to say one thing <laughs> on an elevator to somebody, <laughs> if you teach a child to read, then they'll be able to read to learn. Yeah, I think that's so important. Just if you're in um, with us live and you have a question, if there's a chat box open, feel free to send one, or you can tweet at us at GCE underscore US. We'll be here for a couple more minutes. Um, but of course, you mentioned an email in case I had questions about. Yes, and I, I want to make sure that I clarify that. So if you if you would like to get our um, if you would like to get our a handbook for how you have an event. It's Office of Education at USA.gov. I didn't say that right. Um, and you can um, actually CC uh, Amy Harris, a, a H Harris or A M Harris at USAID.gov. Uh, if you want the Global Book Alliance, uh, that's globalbookalliance.org. Um, so those are two of the ways that you can reach us so that we can connect with you and help you if you're interested in writing some books using the software. Just out of curiosity, I know that my foreign language outside of English is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know that I shouldn't write any book in uh, another language, but I, is there any type of translation available? Yeah. Or And you know, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, we're, we're writing the books. You could write a book in English. Uh, a lot of people in this country will write a book in English. Some, if it's a really great book, somebody's going to go, I really like that book. And so mm. uh, somebody who speaks English in Hausa, from, somebody from Nigeria, part of our diaspora, or a college student out there, uh, like those 15 languages we had in the room at Indiana University, uh, they can take an existing book because they'll be able to go into this digital library and go, I really like that book. So mm -hmm. I'm going to translate that into my language. Okay. Uh, so you can write the books, but you can also translate existing books into a language, put it back into the cloud, into this. So now you start building these shelves uh, where books are translated into different languages. So you don't necessarily have to know the language, but they're also, and we're using the Bloom software, but we also partner with African Storybook, and they have software, and they have some translation uh they can do some translating. Um, Prothem Books has software. So the Bloom software is not the only one. Mm -hmm. Some have qualities. Our software is different because it lets you write decodable books. If you're studying to be a teacher, you'll know that at first grade, when you first walk in the door, you may only be introduced to three or four letters to begin with. So the books to practice have to only use those three or four letters. And then you add on to it. So you're creating leveled books. And our software won't let you go any farther stops you or gives you here are the four letters that you know if you're writing a book for a child oh, that's awesome. at this level so it's guiding you along so that you don't have to walk into the room and understand what a level book is and know what those vowels are which consonants a child would know at that particular time so it won't let you make spaces too big and 
or you know make uh, sentences too long and it leaves a lot of white space and makes you can make the font bigger all of those things that a kindergartner or first grader would need so it gives you those capabilities but other people have products out there and in fact the book you know everything we're talking about with book fun it exists in pieces and places all over the world the global book alliance is trying to bring everybody together to try to uh, to bring all those pieces together and then scale it up so that it's global so there's a lot of great work I went to Rwanda uh, a few months ago and actually saw most of these pieces I got together with publishers with writers with illustrators went up on a mountain and saw all of these uh, people in the village grandparents and parents coming together to help uh, give their children after school opportunities uh, there are lots of local NGOs who are helping us and other partners around the world so there are all of these all of these uh, all of this energy and all of these people who are trying to do things in their own small sphere and the Global Book Alliance is just trying to figure out okay how do we pull all the best ideas together mm -hmm. and get this so that every child gets the benefit of it that's great I'm just also thinking about downloading so mm -hmm. we talked a lot about the be in the cloud so what is where can people download it. Is it on books, phones, computers, what's kind I of think eventually you'll be able to do all of those things. Uh -huh. We're focused on paper books right now okay. and we're more using the technology to help us uh, figure out how to move the books, mm. uh, you know, how to track and trace the books. Uh, but there will come a time and, and we're thinking about it now. So of course if, if people have a cell phone and they have the capability to get a book into that cell phone then we want children to have those books uh, all of those things we hope will happen but it's not like it's all ready to get not in a package and ready to go right now we are really just beginning this process right now and in trying to invite people into the process because you never know who's going to have the great idea yeah very true so we have a question on okay. Twitter um, someone wants to know how they can host an event for the software. They would really like to do Well, that. if you uh, want to get in touch with Amy, <laughs> who's sitting right here, who is at, uh, it's amharris at usa.gov, or you can go to Office of Education Altogether, Office of Education at usa.gov, and just CC Amy. Um, then we'll make sure you get uh, one of our handbooks. Okay. And anybody out there, if you're using it and you want to give us some suggestions, we're looking for ways to improve the handbook. It's one of the reasons we're going to all these colleges this fall, is we're trying to see how many different kinds of events we can have so that we have, in putting it out there, we can say, oh, this is the way the University of Iowa did it, and this is the way San Antonio did it, and this is the way it happened at a community college. And, uh, this is at a large university, or this is the way it happened with a faith-based mm -hmm. event, because it doesn't have to be just on college campuses. So we welcome you to ask us, and we'll look forward to any feedback you can give us as well. And we hope that um, on Thursday, on International Literacy Day, that everybody on here will get on social media and follow us on Literacy Day through at USAID Education or at Christy Vilsack, because we'll be out there um, making sure that you know what's going on that day as we're celebrating the 50th International Literacy Day. And I actually looked that up today because I thought, well, it's the 50th, but why did they have the first one? And mm. so it's a UNESCO, uh, came from UNESCO, and I realized I was 16 years old the first time <laughs> they celebrated International Literacy Day to call attention to this issue of literacy, and we're still doing that. Um, we still have really uh, big problems to solve but as I said each one of us in our own way can help and if it's getting on and and uh, retweeting something that we put out there but we have several hashtags one is hashtag ILD 16 or at or hashtag literacy day either of those will be great ways to join the conversation great so I know you can't see Amy here but uh, <laughs> I couldn't do this without her <laughs> and she's uh, she's the one who's making sure that she's feeding me this information so that you have uh, the, the context for social media, but 
I really appreciate uh, everybody getting on today and having this conversation. And for you, although you're kind of out of the picture, I think you need to scoot over here a little more so they can see you too. <laughs> well, we are so glad to have you. Thank you for joining us. And we will definitely continue to spread the word about how people can get involved because we definitely love to get as many people as possible involved in this issue. I think that's definitely where we've connected with Christy is that we're all about getting people involved, right. showing them how important international education is, and showing how you can do your part to contribute and be a part of it. And we will definitely keep you connected. You can always, as she said, follow at Christy Vilsack on Twitter. You can follow us at GCE underscore US on Twitter. And we be great tools to keep you informed. And we'll be tweeting on Thursday as well to support you know, Literacy Day. It was really you at GCE when I first got this job. <laughs> that introduced to me, you had the contacts with uh, college students all over the country. And it was really up through a process of coming here and talking to your college students who were such activists who were looking for different kinds of projects to do on campus that we started thinking about how we could come up with something that would be the kind of that kind of thing. So it really was GCE and my connection with you over the last four years that has brought us to this place today. So I appreciate you. Uh, whenever it was that you started and started connecting with students on campus and bringing them here to connect them to people in Washington and other places uh, with around the issue of literacy, it's been a huge contribution. And we just want to keep find ways to help collaborate with you to keep that going. Thank you. We, I know we've loved our youth advocates. Shout out to our GCE youth advocates, alumni, all of them doing great things. Some of them teachers. So and sure one of them be. was on the <laughs> Indiana campus when we were there. Yeah. It, was, it was fun to be out on campuses and find your advocates out there. They're a great group. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> so we are so thankful that you guys joined us, and this will definitely be available on our YouTube, so you can watch and rewatch and send to friends to get everyone involved. And we thank you for joining us, and we have asked you to have a great day. Thanks. Happy Literacy Day. <laughs>